Welcome back to Advice Amplified. In this episode, our guest is Asif Naidu. And when I look back on it, that that actually really sped up some of the transformational change that we wanted to put through. Is modern advice effective? What's next for the industry and how do we get there? We talk about Asif's journey with fiscal engineers, the challenges and the disappointments. Um, I don't think you're going to get any business that grows without creaking. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Please subscribe on your streaming platform and don't forget to check us out on TikTok, Instagram and YouTube at Advice Amplified. As if, hey, um, really appreciate you coming on to Advice Amplified. I'm pumped for this chat. Well, I'm really excited too, Pete, and thanks for inviting me. Not at all, not at all. So I was thinking like uh, a lot of what we talk about with, with advice firms that, you know, there might be some point of excitement um, from the leadership or some opportunities or challenges with the business. And, and so often, like from the outside in as a tech provider, we kind of have concerns about the ability to execute and, and how well led the business might be and, you know, cultural change and all those kind of problems that um, are fundamental to doing anything exciting. And I know you, you've been on a really interesting, exciting journey with fiscal engineers. So I figured it'd be cool just to dig into that and, and sort of learn a bit more about it. Well, I joined fiscal engineers for straight five five years ago I did a bit of consultancy work for them first I went in and, and did a bit of a drains up exercise um, to understand what the business needs to do to become more efficient it was a really effective business um, provided a good service to clients but it wasn't necessarily as efficient as it could be quite a clunky machine as I call it uh, quite ironic given the name but I went in there and, and did an assessment of what needed to do and and managed to have my arm twisted to join Full time as as chief operating officer. Um, so I joined second week of March. I think it was of what would that have been twenty twenty? Yeah, right, right on, the right way. at <laughs> the very beginning. So, you know, all this, all these plans that we had to um, start to streamline the operations of the business got fr- had to get thrown out the window. And when I look back on it, that that actually really sped up some of the transformational change that we wanted to put through fiscal engineers at the time because we had we had no choice really so it was a it's been a crazy four years uh, doubled in size like i said in in every single metric but we've really i would say and i'm i'm biased we've, the business has transformed and it looks completely different and that journey has led to to where we are now being part of a really fantastic larger group which is which is progeny yeah i remember it, uh, this is this is talking about uh, when you when you started talking about it, but i remember at the time there were so many memes going around, wasn't there, about um, you know what's which of these three options was the instigator of your digital change? And it was like yeah. you know clear strategic direction, this or COVID. And like, there was so many businesses at the time that it was yeah. like a great string board, wasn't it? Into uh, the the kind of journey you articulated there is like really, um, I think, really interesting. That idea that you've got a strong, well performing kind of maybe like family run business or like this this nub of a really cool thing, but then transforming that into an enterprise is is like a really like conceptual pivot, isn't it? Mm, I wonder yeah. what's the what's the trigger point for for make that making a sensible thing to do, <laughs> and and where do you start? What was the trigger point? I don't know. It, Shane bringing somebody like me in with my background. I mean, you know my background really well. Um, working working in a large organisation, having to deliver change constantly, um, and having an understanding of how different businesses work. Um, I think the trigger, you know, it'd be it'd be wrong of me to say, me personally, I was the one that was a trigger. I think we, Shane, um, the founder, must have thought we need to bring somebody else in or somebody new in to, to, to take us on this next journey. I'm not sure during my tenure there was a trigger that I thought, right, let's go. Yeah. Because I think when I joined, it was always about we need to go at this. Yeah, it's like there's something here and actually less... Yeah, we, we've got to fundamentally do something different to what we've doing before if we're going to hit that next kind of. Absolutely, yeah. you know the, the fiscal engineers had bobbed around the AU, you know the three hundred, four hundred million AUM mark. You know, I joined when it was nineteen years old, and um, you know we've added as much AUM in four years as what was built up in the nineteen years. Yeah, the hard work, I can't take credit. The hard work was done and it gets easier as you get bigger. You know, the referral network and that sort of stuff looks after itself. 
Uh, but it needed a catalyst. It needed the it needed the operations in the background to be able to support that growth. And bloody hell, it was hard work, and it creaked at times, and it, it still does creak at times. But we know it can creak within boundaries that we can control and that we feel comfortable with. Um, I don't think you're going to get any business that grows without creaking, and and it you know, and you're going to feel uncomfortable at times. Yeah, yeah. And is is, is the starting point for that? Cause, um, you, you mentioned a couple of times that sort of understanding the lay of the land and a, a lot of businesses we see um you know that, that haven't gone through that, that kind of change and, and professionalization would probably struggle to answer questions like how long does it take to bring a new client in what are the steps that happen yeah who does those steps yep. how many more clients could we take on yeah so is, was there a process that you went through to sort of well, get it all on the table understand it and then with that visibility re-architect it or? yeah yeah no we absolutely went through that process i mean fiscal engineers shane is a big advocate of data and understanding, hence the name, fiscal engineers. You, you, you measure twice, you cut once. Um, that that's his his ethos, and it served him really well. And it's the it's the bedrock of, of the business. So it had processes laid out, high level wealth management consulting process of this go through to when somebody joins, but also it had some some underlying operational processes, as I call it. Um, but they hadn't been looked at for a while. We, we went through a process of actually let's look at all of these processes and where is the waste? What are we doing unnecessarily? Um, and what is the value point for our client? Because it's all fiscal is all we, we take the approach of um, outside looking and say our processes are built around what our client expects, not our own internal SLAs. Um, so, you know, we, we on the promise over deliver rather than the way around and um we don't have internal slas we we say to the client this is when you're going to get it are you comfortable with it and then we deliver to that expectation if not better um so we re we remapped all of our processes and i'm of the view that um you can have a process which is 100 steps long you've probably heard me say this loads of times when we work together at matty Ailey woods but there's probably only ever 10 value steps in there and they're never going to change in our in, you know, in our industry Financial services, when you boil it down, is a pretty simple, simple industry. There's not going to be that many value steps, but they're really, really important. And those are the bits that you should measure. The 95 steps that sit in between will probably change over time. You know, different technology, integrations, all that sort of stuff, different ways of working. So how can we minimize those 95? But how can we highlight the real five or 10? value points which we called milestones you know these are the points in our process we've got to make sure we're now on with i mean measure that is that stuff like onboarding a new client that preparation around like a client meeting or yeah so for on yeah that's a really good example so you know if we've got an onboarding onboarding a prospect and we know we've got a meeting the milestone is well first of all we'll agree to the date of the meeting and then the, the first milestone will be we've got to make sure we've got everything prepared for that meeting that happens or if the client wants it the day before, we have it done the day before. You might have 10 steps that lead up to that, but my argument is we could do all those 10 steps the day before you need to deliver it. That's not great. That's not controlled, but it doesn't impact the fact that you've got to deliver it on that particular day. So we still do measure the 10, but the real key bit is is that, that final bit where we're saying, right, this is where we're going to deliver to the client. This is the expectation that they've got of us. And we did that across all of our processes built it into workflow, um, now measure it on Power BI. So we've got a real good understanding of all the work that, that flows through the business, what stage it's at in the process, who it's sat with, are we likely to miss the, the date that the client is expecting it, yeah. and are we, gonna, are we gonna deliver it before? From my perspective as, as, excuse me, as a COA, that's sort of been really helpful because the, the press of a button, it's, it's not quite that simple, but we've got, a shed load of data that I know we can pretty much work out where something is at any point in time. Um, um, whether it should be there or not is a different question, but at least we can see it's there. I wonder in, in that journey, because you, you've ended up in such a such an awesome place, was there was there anything on the way through that you probably anticipated being easier than it was or like was, was really one of those um, surprisingly difficult or annoying kind of unexpected rocks in the in the river <laughs> yeah i think i look back on it all of, and actually it was all it all felt difficult at the time because of the backdrop and the environment that was around us 
Um, would we have done it slightly differently? Probably. Uh, we might have slowed it down a bit. We might not have done done stuff concurrently, which we did. Yeah, it's you know, there's lots of stuff around change curve and, and, and stuff like that. We needed to go through it. We didn't need to do it, but we were probably more bullish than we needed to be at times. And I think when I reflect back on it on a small business, the approach that we took was the right approach. Could we have changed the pace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think it was my my background at, um, at a larger firm. When you impart change, you're not sometimes in the changes that's happening, so you don't appreciate what's going on and the the feel and the um, how happy people are or, or not about it. Um, that's one of the things that I learned actually being in a business, it, and it was a family knit business, small in comparison to where I've been in the past. Um, I hadn't anticipated the impact that that change would have on individuals that, you know, doing their job, doing a great job of it, doing it routinely, used to working in a particular way, and then all of a sudden we're saying, you've got to do it this way. And they'll just accept it. And they did accept it, but they were, not everybody was okay with it. Um, and I think that was the thing that I didn't anticipate. And I struggled as a business, we struggled with, um, but we struggled through it together. <laughs> And we, we've come out the end, you know, much better for it. Yeah. I have an opinion on this, but o often in the industry, we look at, you know, an efficient business as being mm. maybe a, a tech stack or yeah. a set of processes that are really efficient. Um, and that's, that's the, the thing you need to adopt. Yep. Go and buy a new back office, go and buy this, go and buy that, go and plug it in. Mm. Um, and increasingly I, I kind of, my belief is the organization is the point of efficiency and you could be able to hot swap the tech in and yeah. change the file. And yeah. that's not the point of difference. Um, you're saying yes. And I'm wondering now, is, is this a question? <laughs> yeah. well, I don't yeah. know if you, you got any yeah. thoughts on, on that being, you know, where, where those lines are drawn or. I think there's something in not being reliant on a single bit of tech. Um, because if you do, you get hamstrung by that tech's ability to adapt and change and, and grow with you. If you've got your processes nailed down, you understand what the value points in your business are. That's where you drive. I personally believe is where you drive the efficiency. Know where your value steps are. What, know what your clients expect of you. Um, and then your technology can flex around that. Um, and yeah, I said earlier, financial services is a pretty simple business. The differentiator is the level of service and the proposition that you've got. I think fundamentally what sits in the background is probably not dissimilar within a fiscal engineers to a St. James's place to whatever, um, you know, you, you, you're taking some money, you're putting it into some sort of environment and you invest in it. Ultimately what it boils down to, that can be done relatively efficiently. Um, it's, it's the output to your clients that you focus in on um, and um, the steps that's needed to deliver that outcome. So if you can minimize your value steps, but those value sets become really valuable. That's where I think you drive efficiency. And that's what we've tried to focus on. Where do our clients value what we do? There's no point in us doing something if the client doesn't value it. I mean, yeah, that's, that, yeah. that, that is the, the, the bleeding heart, isn't it? Yeah. And, and yeah. Has, has there been any kind of feedback from clients or is there, you know, have they gone through a change fatigue or experience or are they kind of blissfully unaware and things are just getting more awesome? From a technology perspective, they've been unaware other than our app, um, but it's obvious when they come in, see a, a really nice office, which clients love um, and, you know, comment on it um, a lot. Um, they've seen the dynamic change within, within the team, you know, with more people join, um, you know, graduates coming through the business. We, you know, we've developed some of our power planners into advisors over, the, over that time as well. So they have seen the shift in the size of the business, I guess, um, they wouldn't have felt some of the technology changes in the background other than the app and things like DocuSign that, that sit within that as well. Um, that's the, the obvious thing. And I think that's the right thing. If they start to feel some of that technology change, something's probably going wrong. So knowing you're not going to sit back and enjoy the fruits of your success, where, where do you think where are the kind of loose plans? I know you probably won't share too much strategic. <laughs> yeah. But, um, where, where do you think, I suppose vaguely, like the industry might go and, and you know, efficiency is always going to get hammered and, you know, the future. <laughs> Look, you know, we've, part, we've joined 
a, a larger group now, Progeny, which is a fantastic business that are, um, are looking at a digital first approach across all of their service lines, you know, not just around their, their wealth business, but, you know, um, they've got law and tax and, and stuff in there as well. I think for us, where do I see technology taking us, fiscal specifically, and, and what have we got in mind? Um, I think for me, it's again, it's con it's continually improving what we do under the bonnet. I think we produce stuff for our clients, which they absolutely love. Um, can we produce that quicker um, with less intervention? That's where the focus has got to be. What form that takes in terms of technology, I'm not 100% sure. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, we've coined the phrase of being digital first, not digital only. Um, so we've got to be really careful that we don't overstep the mark with digital, with our clients. Our clients pay us a decent wedge. Um, they expect a high class service which we give them. It's personal to them. Um, if we start to implement too many digital touch points with our clients, then we lose, we lose what's unique about fiscal engineers and what's made it so successful. So I think absolutely there's got to be some change in the background to make the production and the journey of what of our outputs better. Should the client benefit from that? Absolutely they will because instead of us saying two weeks and getting it in a week, we can say two weeks and get it in three days. Um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't change that experience and what they're touching and feeling of fiscal engineers. But I think every firm, you know, if they've got their proposition right, that's what their focus should be on. We, you know, our, we think our proposition's pretty good. So I think I think with that, it's, it's really interesting and, and perhaps wrapping up into a question around how you perceive change in the industry and, and, and the future. Do you see gradual iteration of, of small steps forward um, adding up over time, or is it more like these big lurches forward that you're expecting? Across the industry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it depends on where you are in that value chain of, of the industry as such. I think for a business like fiscal engineers who are part of a, a wider business now, um, Progeny have got some, for us, will make some change that aligns us to 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 the strategic intent of, of the wider group. Um, so I think for, for a business like us, fiscal, um, um, it's gradual. I think we've done a lot of hard work already that makes the next few steps more gradual and it's about enhancing the proposition. I think there'll be other businesses that there's a huge amount of change that will come through that will look to adopt AI, will want to become digital only rather than digital first, um, that will want less interaction with their client or want a hybrid interaction with their client. I think there's huge opportunities for change there. Um, I'm just not sure it's right for the part of the market that we're in because we're our, we're proposition led, people first, um, not digital led and you know, and uh, trying to, it, we're not a volume play. And I think in the volume play or not, not volume is probably the wrong way of putting it with tens of thousands of clients, there's a lot, I think there's some accelerated sort of technology changes that can go on there within the, the, the little space that fiscal engineers in it, it's progressive and it's utilizing some of the great work that our larger parent company have, have developed for us. Um, and so we don't have to do the hard work now. We just adopt it. That's super, super interesting. Yeah, and that, that distinction makes so much sense. I feel like oh, there's so much in there. Um, really enjoyed the really enjoyed the chat. And um, yeah, I feel like we could talk for days. But <laughs> yeah, well, anytime, <laughs> Pete. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> invite me time. But no, I've really enjoyed it. So I, I really appreciate uh, you inviting me. In.